So as you can see, we are packed and loaded down. We are headed to the Ohio Mobile Hunter Roadshow this weekend. Gonna be a blast. Got three mobile setups with me, and maybe I'll take you through them, and then we'll start with the, the footage from down there. Got the XOP in kind of a wobbly position. The quick XOP, buckles on it, straps stay on it, all compact, super nice for my, my current family farm, or, or sister really, just to get up and down the tree super quick. This has been the workhorse the last couple years. I will do a full video breakdown on everything. You see a little preview there, got the pocket arm strapped. Let's get to it. I apologize, it was super windy, but the information coming is solid. Some of the roadshow setups, pretty cool. Double step Titan, XOP, fanny pack, very minimalist. This is Cody's, pretty sweet rig here. shot small compact very efficient with the cable aiders Jacob ultra minimalist with just the dub with just the singles there look at that camera arm tucked in pretty cool small fanny underneath I kind of do like the breakup of the uh, the exterior of the stand definitely uh, noted that Sorry, let me back that up. No, I usually start with a satellite map to identify any um, any residential areas. Um, I also look on Onyx and identify property lines where I can, where I can't be, any public, any private that I have access to. I find out where I can and where I can't be, and then I start to look at the aerial aerial perspective of that um, with satellites. Then I move from that and I start to look at the topo topo lines and I start to look at how I think the deer will will use that particular property uh, in southern West Virginia where I hunt primarily the uh, the trains very rugged very steep and that that helps to sort of guide and and tell me where the deer will want to use a lot unless they're pressured they will use the path of least resistance many times or they'll use areas where they can transition from one region to the next so looking at that and starting to learn and you using your cameras to tie in with your maps like after once you what i'll start out with a piece of property and i'll begin to drop pins i'll be like okay here's a saddle pin i'm going to put a trail camera there okay i'm going to look at this long ridge that dumps into like four hollows where a, di a big buck could come up uh and, and check does you know what i mean transition from one hollow to the next could be a couple different harems of does I'm going to put two cameras up here and I start dropping those pins. I have basically already scouted this area without even setting foot on it. Then I go in those areas and I start to put the puzzle pieces together. I start to put the cameras out, you know, do this in early season, right? Through the spring and summer, watch deer develop, watch deer coming in and out of areas. And then I start to look, at least in West Virginia, this is how it is. In the upper third of the mountain kind of the first flat off of the ridge kind of those magic benches you know they'll come off the ridge areas come out of the deep hollows where it's cool up onto the ridges and they'll they'll start to use that first third off of the mountain um and then uh, I'll, I'll clear cut well i bet you the bedding is going to be closer to that transition line of that clear cut as opposed to the ridge point but in a lot of circumstances if the timber is the same the bedding will be like 
closer towards the ridge point and different bowls, things like that. So I, uh, I'll locate, you know, 20, 25 spots like that in the springtime and I'll go scout every one of them. I'll put boots on the ground. I'll try to find every bed that I can. I'll try, I, I mark every bed down so I know how to navigate through those areas if I want to hunt like a specific bed. Um, once I get done locating beds, I'm looking for specific food sources. So I'm looking for like a white oak flat, single white oak trees, green briar patches. Is there a private ag field a mile away that they're going to be traveling to? I'm trying to put all these, all these things together. And then once I have the food and I have the bedding, I'm looking at terrain features in between the two of them as well. So, you know, if I expect a deer to travel, let's say 200 yards in daylight, and there's a terrain feature like the top of a hog's back of a ridge, 100 yards after the bedding, maybe I'll hunt that, or I'll at least have a camera there. Uh, if it's very monotonous terrain, I'll push a lot closer. Like last year I was, 80 yards from my buck when he was bedded and he got up and dropped down to a white oak flat and I killed him. Which brings me to my next point, the importance of running cameras, especially for targeting like the top tier bucks on public land. So, you know, I might scout 20 different pieces of public a year and maybe there's only one or two of those pieces that hold a deer that I want to chase. So it's really important for me to run as many cameras as possible in these really high in these areas that I have a lot of uh, high expectations in, just trying to locate a deer. That's the that's the number one thing that I need to do is find a deer to kill above everything else. Um, so I'll run cameras on the hub scrapes down in the bottoms where all the ridges kind of fan down and meet. I'll run the cameras on secondary food sources. I'll run the cameras on any sort of terrain feature that I can find. I don't generally run cameras over bedding because I don't want to I don't want to intrude throughout the year to check them and I don't want to maybe even spook that deer off his bed with like a camera flash or anything like that. I try not to do that. Um, and I don't really run cameras on primary food sources either. Reason being is the majority of the deer that I'm chasing just aren't making it to that food source in daylight and I would rather use that camera for daytime intel somewhere. That's very important to me. Your number one buck. At what point did, when he, if he disappears or changes patterns, or at what point do you make the decision to shift to buck number two on your list? Uh, it doesn't take me very long. I mean, if I if I think that deer is completely off the property or whatever, I'm not going to set back and wait for a ghost all year. Is it there's is there is there something that tees you off like you just a lack of tracks or lack of fresh like rubs or like what tees you it, off to make it? It could be thing? from an observations you know numerous observation sets it could be from you know the lack of trail camera pictures that I'm now getting from the deer or sometimes it's just gut feeling you know of thinking the deer is off the property it's such a tough it tough sucks and it's a bad spot to be in and I don't like it but it happens well, well the thing is too though like there's also a certain there's a certain point in time to where like if you're quick to give up sometimes you you Oh, I'm gonna tell I, you right. You know, I mean, like, there's been. I mean, last year is a prime example of that. I had a deer that I had pictures of in the summer, and I lost track of him. I couldn't find him. I got onto another deer. I was hunting that deer hard. I killed him. The night, the evening, I killed my buck. I was sitting in a truck with a buddy, waiting on another buddy to show up to go pull my deer out, and my cell cam went off, and there he was. And he was. 30 inches bigger. Uh, mine's usually the second week of December. I'll pick out a target buck and spend every... I'll check out all these other areas. Oh, you give it a time, like an actual calendar date. Yeah, yeah he does. It's pretty cool. So, wait, so, so the, uh, can you add content? So by that, you mean you, you wait to make a shift to a second buck by the second week of December? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah, the second week of December. So I usually find, if I can find one, I find a target buck, uh, you know, hopefully before... October 1 and I'll concentrate my whole time on that target buck and in my spare time I'm running different cameras on other farms trying to locate other bucks in case something happens to that one. Backup plan. Have you yeah. ever hunted down a small buck? Yes. Yeah, just because you were like... Oh yeah, well usually, like like I was telling somebody, usually the bucks that I kill in late season are Management. 20 to 30 inches smaller than what I passed up during the regular season. It's just how it works out. Yeah. Um, but. Um, so what I do is I then I concentrate all my efforts on him 
and sometimes you know he's like gone but I keep waiting on him to show back up I keep hunting keep picking through the area scouting hoping that something's gonna tee me off to where I can get on him and then if it goes through our gun season is uh, the Monday after Thanksgiving so as, once it goes through that you get through the gun season and he hasn't showed back up again then I'll uh, change my uh, tactics on other bucks other areas see and I'm way too impatient for that I can't I I wish I could do that but I can't and I get a week or two in the season and you're like I know there's a big nine point in this part of the property I'm trying to kill that big nine point but you're still but you, does that make sense like what I'm saying um, like but you're not spending all season fun no season so fun. so like I guess what trips my trigger now is is absolutely no information I guess hmm. and instead of um like I just want to go out there and hunt, and I want to, you know, use like 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 woodsmanship and just scout and walk and just just be there, be present in in the timber. Because for so long I felt like I, it was like a job to me, and I was trying to find a specific deer, and I was trying to do so much of this uh, that. But I'm also a guy. I'm I'm a, I say don't overthink, because I'm the biggest overthinker there is. So when I do things like that. And I start to look at maps too hard, or I start to run cameras. I take way too much stock in what those things are giving me, and then I end up failing even more. It's the same thing with like you know, uh, there was one year I shot my bow every day during the summer. One year out of my entire life, right? I missed three deer that year. Like in, in the you know, so I don't know if that even makes sense as a, as an example. But so the way I'm doing it now is I'm looking for a deer, but I'm doing that in the moment. Now I know that coming about it this way it's gonna be a, it's a way more long shot and a shot in the dark like when I came down here and I started scouting I had no prior intel and it sucked and I wished oh man if I only had five cameras to set out like but it was one of those things where I was like okay I'll just you know trust the process and and, and keep on trucking and um, ended up getting on some some good deer didn't get one shot but it's, so yeah it's just a little different for me now I'm 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 all about walking, um, uh, seeing all the areas. Uh, I do utilize maps a lot now to, to save things that I'm seeing. Um, but does that make sense? I, I'm trying to think. Well, I think, I think to your point too, is there's been a lot of woodsmanship that's been lost. Yeah, because, I agree. and I, I'll be the first to admit that even myself, I've got track in, in that trail camera thing before where I'm relying on them so much because you're so busy in life, you know, with family and work and everything that, you know, that we all have going on all the time. But sometimes I think it's good to step back and get away from them a little bit and let your natural instincts and your woodsmanship take over the moments. And yeah, and sometimes, you know, like I mentioned before about seeing deer skirt camp. There you have it. What an awesome time at the road show. Little snippets of some high caliber individuals. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Be on the lookout for more videos soon on mobile hunting. Local to this area and with that being said, we have a powerhouse group of guys here. Local to this area.